Welcome to the Construction Disruption Podcast, where we uncover the future of design, building, and remodeling. I'm Todd Miller of Isaiah Industries, manufacturer specialty residential metal roofing and other building materials. And today, my co-host is Ethan Young. Ethan, we are back from hiatus. We haven't recorded one of these in a yes, while. Yes, we are. Uh, but, and so we're going to, I feel a little rusty. I don't know about you. Yeah, it's been, I mean, what, six months or so? So maybe it's longer. Been a while. We had quite a few yeah. in the can when we went on hiatus and worked through those. But uh, I'm excited to be back. Um so uh, one thing I will remind everybody, we are uh, going to be back once again here in season two doing our challenge words. And uh, with our challenge words, each one of us on the show has been given some secret word that we are challenged to work into the conversation. And we were given that by one of our illustrious uh, co-people here on the show. So um, you, the listeners, might be listening, try to figure out what those weird words are that we might say. Um, and then at the end, we will announce what those words were and whether we were successful or not. So today we're going to kind of continue the show and kick off here season two, um, by taking a deep look, look actually at new construction, as well as trends and current issues and some exciting things for the future happening in new construction. And, uh, to help us along the way today. We're very excited about today's episode as our guest is Kyle Bobbitt of Kyle Bobbitt LLC based in Wake Forest, North Carolina, an unlimited licensed general contractor with a focus on creativity and problem solving. Kyle's company builds custom homes as well as other buildings in North Carolina, Florida, and Tennessee. Their projects typically range from $1 million to $50 million in size, so they are not doing small stuff. Um, and as you look at the homes they have built, you really see a, a bent toward contemporary design with a European flair is the best way I know to describe it. So, Kyle, welcome to Construction Disruption. It's a pleasure to have you as our guest. Thank you so much, Todd. Appreciate it. Good morning, Ethan. Well, I, I just kind of gave the audience a teaser on your background, but why don't you go ahead and tell us a little bit about yourself, how you came to be a part of this great industry, and you know what, what's your company up to today? What sort of projects you got going? Again, Kyle Bobbitt, Unlimited General Contractor, been in construction for two decades now. Uh, father was a builder. Grandfather was a builder. I was on job sites my entire life since I was five years old, right? They were dragging me around and uh, just having a good time. I think I had the first nail in my foot when I was about seven or eight. And, uh, of course I think mom, mom put a stop to the job site visits probably at least about a week until, you know, I could convince her I was good. Uh, as far as what we have going on today, we actively do maybe 40 to 50 houses at a time. At um, a time. Holy cow. At a time. Yeah. So it's, it's always a lot going on. Uh, I also do some commercial stuff, some upfits, things like that. So it's it's always a lot going on. And, you know, this area, this market has always been hot. Uh, even when the housing market crashed in 2008, 9, 10, 11, 12, it was still just booming in the Raleigh, Durham, Wake Forest area. So we, we've always had just tons of work and a lot of good people out here. And, uh, you know, we just build as much as we can to the best of our ability. So... That's really interesting. And and so I'm I'm just kind of curious. I mean, you're saying that it's still booming down in your area. I mean, is any slowness at all or anything on the horizon? Are you projecting continue to, to remain strong on new construction or what's happening? Yeah, I think we're continuing to go strong in this area in particular. I'm, statistically speaking, uh, I think I read 73 families are moving into this area every month. Uh, excuse me, every week. Wow. Uh, from out of state. Uh, the top biggest states are, you know, New York, New Jersey, uh, Connecticut, Pennsylvania, Massachusetts. A lot of the people are leaving the city and trying to find a more rural life. And something that Raleigh offers in particular is it's a city center, but it has a lot of little small rural towns all around it, kind of like in a bubble. So people find that very attractive and they move here. And, uh, you know, in North Carolina in particular, if you're in the center of the state, in two hours, you're on the coast and two hours to the west, you're in the mountains. So it's it's kind of a kind of an awesome scenario for people who are looking to relocate. 
Uh, we also see a lot of people from Florida making their way back up to North Carolina. So, Well, it sure is a beautiful area, no doubt about it. You know, part of my wife and I's uh, dream retirement may involve uh, the coastal Carolinas. You never know. So. Um, so I see that you like to travel and you like outdoor activities. Um, maybe kind of a strange question, but um, how have those things influenced your career as a builder? I think traveling opens your mind, right? And uh, I've been, I've been everywhere, man. I, you know, Switzerland is probably one of my favorite places on the planet. Uh, seeing the way they build houses is amazing. I've also spent time in Japan, so it's taken little pieces of everything. And you know, if you take the the quality and craftsmanship from somewhere like Japan, and you see the way they do heavy timber framing. Do you turn around and you look at Switzerland and what they do, especially for snow loads? And, uh, and, and then you go through Europe and you see that kind of contemporary design or modern design all through Germany and Berlin. You see a lot of modern designs out that way. So as I've kind of traveled around the world, I've just seen all kinds of, of different ways of building, and it really opened my mind to more than just that traditional stick frame. Well, I think that's really interesting. You know, so often when you look at other countries and how they build, you, you see that, you know, they've been building for resilience and permanence for centuries. And that just seems like something that our country now is suddenly trying to, to figure out how to do. So I think that perspective you've gained, especially from uh, Asia and Europe, uh, Japan, you mentioned, and uh, I know, you know, when I was in Japan a few years ago, too, I was just amazed by just the level of skill um, that they put into construction and, and what that looks like. I mean, guys are installing our roofs wearing white gloves. Uh, that doesn't normally happen here in the States. <laughs> no, it doesn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did have a question. So is your company doing more design build work or do they, you guys build more to spec from other designers? Uh, I'd say it's probably about 90, 10. Uh, we do have in-house architects and structural engineers. I certainly prefer to do design build work over spec works from other designers. Uh, mostly because my guys, number one, they know how I build and how I like it. And uh, you, you know, everybody has their own quirks, I guess, as a builder, you know, or whatever your pet peeves are. Uh, so they just happen to know mine. And uh, the biggest thing, I, the biggest advantage, I think, is the ability to control the design also helps control the price point. Right. Because what you put into the structure can, can greatly affect, you know, what that what that overall price point looks like, just depending on how it's designed. Yeah, makes sense. Definitely more of a unified effort. You know, both of you guys kind of fighting on the same team, I guess, just put it in a different way. But. That leads, per- yeah, that leads perfect into the next question I had, which was, can you tell us a little bit more about like the makeup of your company? You mentioned stuff about architects and stuff, but what else, who else is part of your team? Yeah, sure. So all in all, we're a construction management firm, first and foremost. Uh, it's myself, my wife. Uh, she's the vice president, co-owner. She kind of oversees uh, the books, the accounting side of things. Uh, I usually focus more on the project management side of things and kind of moving the future of the company in the right direction. Gotcha. Uh, we have in-house architects, in-house engineers. Uh, we have our own, you know, project management team, a construction manager, which kind of uh, heads that group. And then of course, site superintendents. And uh, we have some in-house crews that do some work and then we sub out most of the work just depending on okay, what those yeah. specifics are. So what's it, What's it been like to work with sub crews recently? I mean, how do you kind of get around? I know one of the big things we talk about is this, you know, skilled labor shortage and all that. What's that been like for you? You know, I think uh, I think like everybody, it's 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 been rough. Uh, I think I'm I'm a little bit more blessed than most. Uh, a lot of these boys have been working with me for for two decades. Some of the subs that I use, uh, you know, my dad used. Uh, some of the companies are even farther along than that. So in, in some of that aspect, I've been fortunate to have worked with the same group of guys. But as they retire out uh, and the younger guys come in, it, it, it's getting harder and harder for sure because they're not they're not really trained properly. Right. Like I, I was on a job site my entire life, so I kind of knew what to expect. But for the younger guys that are coming into it, uh you know, and especially we, we see a lot of immigrants that are in the construction field now, and they're maybe used to a different type of construction, uh, more of like the masonry or 
block or cement and things like that. Uh, whereas the stick built houses, which is more traditional here, they, they struggle with that aspect of it. And the, the skilled, I would say the skilled labor is getting harder and harder to find every day. Uh, I think I, I think I read statistically for every eight people that retire in this industry, only one comes in. And that's a that's alarming because, you know, it, it used to be um, your material and labor were kind of tit for tat in terms of, of what something cost uh, and what we're going to see moving forward with that as this as the labor market gets tighter is when you have 10 plumbers and eight retired and there's only two left, they're going to demand more money for their time. And that's just going to raise the price of square foot, you know, for every house. And it, the labor market is going to drive the cost of construction through the roof at some point. Yeah, I think that's an interesting observation and certainly something that we've been seeing even in the specialty trades as well. Um, labor has been a major driver in cost in recent years. I'm kind of curious, what do you do to make sure that your sub crews are working up to your standards? I understand you've got the job site superintendents, but um, tell us a little bit what that looks like. I'm a I'm a tough builder to please. You know, I'll, I'll be the <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be the first one to admit it. I uh, I'm very particular and I, I kind of have OCD in that nature. Right. Like every line has to be straight and clean and uh it's real it's real difficult for these boys to work with me but i think the biggest thing is just communication you know construction's one of the biggest industries in the world and we always fail on communication and you know the clients communicate with their builders and the builder communicates with their team which are communicating with the owners of the companies that send out these guys to do the work and we all know as the story gets told things change. So I, I think having that on-site presence uh, greatly helps. I think, you know, treating everybody with dignity and respect really helps uh, getting on the same page. Uh, we've tried to use technology to help. Uh, we try to get the superintendent some paper in their hand, you know, that just kind of highlights what we expect and they communicate with that with the guys in the field. And it, it really breaks down to communication, you know, and Obviously, quality control is a big part of that and just kind of stand on top of it as you see things unfold. You know, we talked about the kind of the current labor issue, but another big thing that's come up recently in construction is this trend towards sustainable design, um, fortified construction, and then also energy efficiency. Those are all three big things that we keep hearing about. So what's your take on all that? I think it's exciting. Uh, I think I think the construction industry has to evolve um, I, I think if we're not careful, those items can drive up the cost of construction you know, to where, you know, the affordable, quote, affordable housing uh, it is not so affordable for the average American. So we have to be careful with that particular part of it. And, you know, a lot of it is just going to have to be chalked up to growing pains until we can get it figured out. But I, I'm really excited about it. I definitely think there's better ways to build uh, and just trying to make sure that we can build better, more efficiently, and keep the costs at a reasonable price is 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 the the sweet spot. That's going to be hard to find for a couple of years until we can get it all figured out. Yeah, you're right. There's all kinds of trade offs there, aren't there? Pros and cons to everything. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I'm curious. So uh, this is, seems a little bit non sequitur, but what is the most unusual thing you have ever had a client ask for you to include in their house? Oof. Ryan, you might have to edit this out and we start over. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the most unusual thing, uh, to be honest with you, is uh, is a red room. Yeah. A red room. OK. I, yeah. I can probably let my imagination figure that one out, I suppose. Yeah. You know, I, I tell my clients uh, there's three people in the world you don't lie to and your doctor, your lawyer and your general contractor. Uh, <laughs> you know, if, if you want me to build you a true custom home, I, I have to know exactly what it is I'm building. So if I have to, you know, soundproof some walls or put in some extra blocking with three bolts or whatever that may look like uh, to make sure you, you have the best time in your house that you can, you know, it's fine with me. I just have to know what I'm building. So, so uh, th that's a little bit different. Uh, yeah, I don't know how I would have followed that up. So a few years ago, a friend of mine built a house, and and the most proud thing he was that he had in his house was a urinal. Do you put many no. urinals in houses? I'm curious. Huh. Well, 
not not a stand up urinal. No, I I, okay. I see a. I see a lot more trend towards bidets lately. The last couple of years, I feel like I've put a bidet, at least one in almost every single house I do. And uh, it's interesting what people ask for. You know, it's construction. Construction can be so difficult in that aspect uh, because the devil is in the details, you know, and uh, every every house has a a piece to play and putting the puzzle together and it it almost has to, it's like a perfect symphony to try to pull it off. Whereas everyone has to be in coordination to make it work. Yeah. Interesting. So you stepped your toe into 3d home printing. Um, tell me a little bit about that. I know you've been kind of one of the, the first to try that, um, on a serious basis. And, uh, uh, tell us a little bit about that, how it went and, and what you think the future may be there for it. I see, I see 3d printing as, uh, being a way to, evolve the construction industry. I'm one in particular love the idea of it. It obviously has pros and cons and kinks, you know, that we have to work out. And, uh, the price point is the biggest one and, you know, one for one side by side, uh, whether you're printing a wall or doing a stick frame wall, the cost for the material is about tit for tat either way. Hmm. As we evolve the software and the machines become more efficient, that price point is going to go down as we figure out the mixture of materials. I think that price point continues to go down. Uh, but where you really say that is the time, you know, a, a 2,200 square foot house, we can print the walls in about 17 to 20 hours. Wow. Um, so That's you imagine interior if interior and exterior. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. So if you imagine you show up on a job site and the slab is poured, the plumbing underground is done kind of like your traditional method, you pull the machine out, you print the walls, and pretty much you're, if you have the uh, capability to prefab the roof, uh, which is well, something we're looking into pretty heavy right now to set with a crane, we would be able to print the walls, come back the next day, and lower the roof on top of it. And uh, pretty much within five days, we'd have underground plumbing, slab poured, walls printed, and a roof on that is, I mean, that, I am flabbergasted by that. I had no idea that it could happen, you know, that quickly. And you're right. You know, you prefab the roof and drop it on. And uh, that's amazing. So, um, you know, one of the big topics right now, too, is, is AI, um, artificial intelligence. Kind of curious, how do you see that impacting design and building in your business in the future? I think in the next decade, we're going to see AI uh, take over a lot of the design work Mm -hmm. Uh, A lot of the structural design, load calculation, things like that, kind of the front end of construction that people don't really know or see much about. I think AI is going to definitely be able to help on the front side of construction Uh, in in terms of, of, you know, AI or robots being able to hang drywall or or paint houses efficiently. I I definitely don't see that taking off in the next decade, maybe in you know 20 years from now. Uh, we had 30 years from now. We have a long way to go from that perspective. But I, I think with uh, machines, uh, it, it, it's going to change the industry. I, I know in Germany, they're uh, they're experimenting with AI software that's running a machine that lays concrete blocks. And uh, it's it has the ability where a human basically loads a pallet of blocks in the machine and the machine cements it and sits it down. And it's it's has the capability to lay about three thousand blocks in one day, which is about ten good like you know brick masons. Uh, so within ten years from now, we may see some of that happen. But I think the biggest impact it's going to have is on the front end. That's interesting. Let's talk a little bit about you know, and we we talked a little bit about how you do those things, but let's talk about building materials a little bit. Um, anything exciting you're seeing coming up uh, in terms of actual materials these days, something that really makes your socks go up and down? Or are we still just kind of stodgy and doing the same old stuff as manufacturers? I, I see a lot of interesting concepts, uh, some good, some bad. I, I think sit panels are, are very good, interesting products and not necessarily a new concept, but it's it's kind of gaining some ground where you, you know, you're prefabbing that structural insulated panel and you're able to set the walls pretty fast. Uh, I think the ICF blocks are a great idea. You know, the, there's a company that basically sells their, their blocks almost like a Lego where you put the house together. Um, 
all of these, all of those different ideas and those different materials, I, I think it's all innovative and very exciting. We just have to be careful because we don't know exactly how it's going to respond over a long term period. And, you know, that's one of the biggest things in construction is uh, it's always evolving because we're always learning from our previous mistakes. And that goes back hundreds of years. You know, I mean, we're we just now in the last you know, 50, 60 years understand how important it is to have a footer under the house instead of just putting it up on some blocks or some rocks that you find in the field. Right. So it's, you know, construction has come a long way pretty quickly. And uh, as these new materials come out, I, I think it's exciting and uh, it's something certainly I keep my eye on. And, I, you know, I cautiously proceed in the right direction, I hope. I'm, I'm kind of curious on something as a manufacturer. Um, you know, let's let's talk about finished work and finer details. If if you could push some of that off to a manufactured, you know, prefabricated type thing, rather than have to have crews to do it, would that be desirable to you, or would you rather keep with the fit and finish being under your control? I, I would certainly prefer to go the prefab route. I think the biggest thing is trying to find that fine line of communication between someone like me as a builder and someone as a, as a prefabrication house is trying to communicate what that client wants. You know, the, the biggest part of my business is the ability to offer something unique. You know, if we're, if we're talking about building a hundred houses that all looks the same, that's a builder's dream and a prefab guy's dream. Uh, but when you get more into like custom homes and that niche of custom homes, every single house is different or has its own different layout. And I think trying to find a way to streamline the design side of it and where the prefab guys don't have to spend so much money redoing machines or setting up and, you know, that type of scenario. I think that's where that sweet spot is. So it really all started. That, that makes a lot of sense. Kind of starts with design and, and figuring out that sweet spot. So. Um, you kind of gave a tease of this earlier, but, you know, look into your crystal ball. What does home building look like in 20 years? Wow. In, uh, in 20 years, uh, are we talking about what it looks like aesthetically, cost-wise, material-wise? That's a, that's a loaded question. Maybe, well, maybe, uh, maybe aesthetically and maybe a little bit about just the, the functionality, the, the trades and, you know, what it's going to look like for the builder. Will builders look significantly different? I definitely think uh, builders will look significantly different. I think as, as AI progresses, as the software progresses and as the tech progresses, I, I see the builders being a lot more tech savvy than we ever have been before. Um, from an aesthetic perspective, if I'm on my, if I hit my mark on 3D printing, I mean, I think that that op opens up the door to some pretty significant design changes. You know, the, the 3D printing has the ability to print wavy walls, uh, you know, which can look really cool, and they're they're also strong as they can be, and they break the wind instead of trying to put a box in the wind. So, in areas that are heavily impacted with hurricanes, tornadoes. Uh, I think 3D printing is going to really play a factor in those areas, even high snow loads because uh, the walls are so much stronger. And, you know, if you think about the, the thickness of a wall, uh, you know, our thickness is two by four, is two by six. But if you're printing with a machine, the machine literally just has to travel that extra two inches every time it turns a corner. So it's very easy to achieve a 10 inch wall, a 12 inch wall, so I see thicker walls with cooler designs uh, and, and the ability to offer something a lot more unique at a, at a fair price point. Uh, so I, I think we're going to see some kind of like Jetson futuristic type of printed houses in 20 years for sure. And that was my favorite cartoon growing up. So I think we're like all aren't we like already beyond when the Jetsons actually lived in terms of years. But uh, yeah, we're going to get there. Awesome. <laughs> Slowly but surely. So what do you really tell me? What do you really love about what you do? That's that's a loaded question, too. Uh, I, I won't you know, ask I, what you hate. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> you know what? I, I tell you, I, I don't feel like I've ever worked a day in my life. You know, construction for a lot of people is just a job uh, and they go to it and they dread it or they hate it. It's just a paycheck to them. But I just love to build. I mean, I, my slogan, right, that I tell everybody is I can build anywhere, anytime, anything under any yeah. circumstance. 
And it's because I, you know, I see it from that perspective. I, I love what I do. I love to build. I love my clients. Uh, I love that relationship that I get to build with people, both individually and professionally. Uh, I get to see a lot of different personalities and perspectives. And it really opens up the world to me uh, just to see it from all different angles and trying to achieve, you know, that perfect solution for everyone uh, is, is pretty amazing. And just you know, when you when you go somewhere like a raw piece of land and there's nothing there and six months later, you've created the dream that someone envisioned for years as they're saving their money to build this thing. Uh, you know, when they when they give you a hug or they cry and, you know, say thank you and, you know, or whatever that may look like. Or maybe they I get the occasional, hey, can you come for Thanksgiving or let's do something for Fourth of July. So a lot of my clients become friends, uh, you know, I and I'm, I'm the godfather probably to. 17 or 18 of my clients kids over time uh, wow you know so yeah so I, I build a very unique strong relationship with my clients for sure that's probably my favorite part that's very cool I, I'm curious what advice would you have for younger folks out there who are thinking about a career in design or construction um, any real advice how should they go about that how do they learn who should they be paying attention to I think the biggest thing is they have to be real with themselves and, and identify first and foremost what it is they really like uh, and then try to seek out that professional in that industry. You know, whether that's design, architectural, engineering, building, uh, framing, carpentry, roofing, whatever that is, that they really enjoy doing and and try to try to apprenticeship. You know, I, I think the industry would do really good to go back towards apprenticeship programs and um, they pulled it. They pulled apprenticeship programs out of high schools for a long period of time, and that's something that is kind of a generational thing that we're going to see. And that's why this labor market is tight. If you go back and look historically for about thirty years now, the schools slowly have pulled the trades out, and they're they're kind of saying, and their dads are saying, "You don't want to do that. Go to college, get a degree." And for thirty years, that's kind of been the norm. And uh, all these kids are not getting into construction the way they used to, uh, or their dad was in it and he's telling them, oh, don't do it, don't do it. And, you know, we're going to all pay for that in the price point per square foot and as an industry in whole, just that conversation of, of kind of pushing kids away from hard work. Uh, but I think they definitely should find apprenticeship programs, find the right people to talk to. I always encourage the younger guys. I get a lot of messages on LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, TikTok, even, um, you know, just guys just asking general questions. And I do the best I can to guide them. And we actually work with a college and uh, at ECU. And I have a couple of internships that come with me in the summers. Uh, one of them's been with me for two years, John Spargo. And uh, he's going to actually come on full time afterwards. So I'm really excited that uh, that local college in particular has pushed these people these young guys and women uh, to get into the construction industry. And I think with saying that, I think women play a big part of it. Uh, women make the best project managers. And I know for a long time they say, oh, you know, woman doesn't belong in construction. But as this industry evolves, I tell you, I see more and more opportunity for women to get into construction than ever before. That's awesome. That's great. Well, Kyle, this has been a great time together. Thank you so much. Um, we're really close to wrapping up what we call the business end of things. Um, is there anything we haven't covered yet today that you'd sure like to share with our audience? Just keep being innovative. Keep pushing forward. Keep evolving. You know, the more people tell you no, just keep trying harder. Uh, all because all because 100 people are going one direction don't necessarily mean that that's the direction you should go. So if you find yourself walking alone on a road, down a path, you're probably doing the thing that no one else thought possible. So just keep pushing forward. I love that. Great, great advice and great wisdom there. So um, I have to ask you before we close out, um, if you'd like to participate in a little thing we call our rapid fire questions. So rapid fire consists of seven questions we're going to ask you. Some may be serious, some may be a little more on the silly side. Um, all you have to do is give a response and um, audience needs to understand if Kyle agrees to this challenge. Um, he has no idea what we're about to ask him. So are you up to the challenge of rapid fire? Well, uh, being one of the, uh, the head, head, head leaders in probably the most intense industry 
uh, the world knows, I think I can handle some rapid fire questions. No doubt. Well, we'll <laughs> alternate asking questions. Ethan, you want to ask the first one? Yeah, I can do that. Uh, question one, what's a product or service that you bought or used recently that was like a game changer for you? Kind of like, oh, wow, where's this been? You know, do you have something like that? I think I think definitely ICF blocks. You know, at North Carolina, we don't have the, uh, the winners that the upper states use. And uh, I know the northern states have used ICF blocks for a long time. Uh, but I think ICF blocks are a great product that the south doesn't really know about or the hotter areas don't really know about but they work extremely well for uh basements and things like that and really easy product to put together uh it's definitely been a game changer for me in terms of basements that's cool we actually have a company here in pickle ohio that makes icf blocks and uh, they also make some foam parts for our systems as well so uh question number two um what is a funny childhood memory a funny childhood memory well uh, we have a, we have a river that, uh, it's called the Tar River that flows through the state that goes all the way to the ocean. And, uh, me, my brother, my grandfather and his best friend, Pete, uh, used to take the boat and we'd put in behind a pizza hut in Franklin County. And we'd take a, a whole day trip in a little John boat all the way down to the ocean. And, uh, about an hour and a half in, now this is, this is early 1991, 1992. Uh, cell phones were not a thing yet now. And uh, <laughs> a snake a snake fell into John boat from a tree. And uh, I remember Pete, who was he was an old, old redneck now, old country man. Mm-hmm. And uh, he pulled out his shotgun and pointed it right at that snake and shot him. And he says, don't worry, boys, I got him. And uh, sure enough, the boat was sinking all at the same time. <laughs> so <laughs> we... Uh, we oh, we no. walked uh yeah we walked the rest of the way and uh my my grandmother was there waiting for us and she was just pissed because we were about five hours late she's <laughs> like what why are you so late and she's like and where's the boat <laughs> 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 so uh yeah that that's probably one of my most fond memories for sure. oh my goodness that's hilarious that's a good one yeah all righty <laughs> question three what's your favorite sushi roll Okay. Wow. Uh, I have to go with uh, the dragon roll. Dragon roll is probably my favorite. Gotcha. There you go. Good I don't one. know if that's universal or not, but. <laughs> I think so. Yeah, pretty yeah. much. Okay. Next question. If you could spend a day with someone, anyone from history, who would you spend that day with? From history. Uh, so in, in the past, right? In the Nobody past. Present. Yeah. Someone's probably dead. I'd probably say Benjamin Franklin. Well, my business partner has confessed to me that he thinks he may be Benjamin Franklin reincarnated. So maybe I can get you guys some time together. I don't know. You may just discover that he's a little crazy. I don't know. <laughs> All righty. Question five. What would you most like to be remembered for at the end of your days? I think for me, the most important thing would be uh, for my, uh, my kids to remember me as a good dad. Mm-hmm. I think that's above everything. Love it. Love it. Good stuff. Okay, next question. One of our favorites here on the show. Um, if you had to eat a crayon, what color of crayon would you choose to eat? Well, my favorite color is green, so I got to go with green. Green crayon. Okay. It's weird how some people base their answer. They, they always take this question very seriously. I'm not going <laughs> to ask you the crayon, but a lot of people say white because they figure it won't show up on their teeth as bad. Okay. <laughs> Okay, would have been the last well, thing I thought about. With uh, with the amount of coffee that I drink on a daily basis, using that analogy, I'd have to go kind of yellow. But <laughs> <laughs> I hear it. yeah, I made that vote. <laughs> We've gotten all kinds of answers with that. Like, I mean, I don't know, orange and green and red. Like taking a big bite out of a you know Macintosh app. But I always think with red, like it look all I don't know, all bloody or something. I don't know. Maybe too much thought into it, but. Yeah, yeah, maybe yeah. so. Maybe so. so. All right. Here's the last question. Who was your favorite teacher in school and what do you remember them for? Wow. Uh, I would have to say it was my ninth grade math teacher. Her name was Miss Yoder. And uh, in that time, she was 82 years old. She was still teaching. And she was just old school, man. Like there was no calculator. There was no anything. And, you know, she used to give us such a hard time and 
you know, we were, I, I was always in advanced math. Um, so I was already past like algebra and I was actually in the pre-calculus at that time. And I, I went all the way through calculus two and three. Uh, she was just, she was real hard, real strict. You know, she always used to tell us we couldn't even think ourself out of a paper bag. You know, she's like, yeah, <laughs> your, your, your generation would suffocate instead of just tearing the bag open. You know, she was, she was hardcore. She was hardcore. But I tell you, as hard as she was, uh, I have to dedicate probably my mathematical skills to that one woman in particular, because uh, she made me use my brain instead of a calculator, which was, you know, calculators were, were always pushed real heavy all through school to help you. Uh, and she just absolutely refused to even let them walk through her door. So, so when I can shoot numbers off the top of my head now, it's definitely because of her. That is awesome. Good answer. Hey, that was fun. Thank you. Um, so if uh, folks, listeners would like to get in touch with you, um, uh, visit your website, all that type of stuff, how can they do that? Yeah, so uh, it's I, I do my business in my name because uh, I take it real personal. Uh, my website is kylebobbitt.com. That's K-Y-L-E-B-O-B-B-I-T-T.com. We're also on uh, Facebook, Instagram, X, which used to be Twitter, TikTok, all of the things. Uh, we have a marketing person that does that for us. So I, I don't really know what all those IDs are. Uh, but if you type in Kyle Bobbitt or Kyle Bobbitt LLC uh, in Google alone, you probably can find us pretty quick. Cool. Good deal. Um, well, this has been great. Thank you so much. I've enjoyed this and you've provided us a great insight into, you know, what's happening in your neck of the woods, what's happening with building in general and uh, where the future may go. You are definitely on the front end of things and putting up 40 to 50 jobs at a time. I guess you got to be. So uh, kudos to you. Good stuff. No, I appreciate that. Thank you. Well, um, how are we doing our challenge words? I know I got mine in flabbergasted. Ethan, you worked yours in right there at the end with uh, Macintosh. There, yeah. Macintosh. Kyle, I, I if you did yours, you got it in so good, I missed it. Did you get your word in? I did. When you asked me about urinals, I said uh, I was I kind of dived into construction and a piece by piece to make a puzzle. And I said, it's almost like a perfect symphony and it all has to work together. Awesome. Symphony was your word. Yeah, yeah. Cool stuff. Yeah. Back to the urinals, man. My friend was so <laughs> proud. He, I mean, he, he, I was at a relatively, you know, nice, I call it a high class, highfalutin party at his house. Everyone that walked in the door, he had to take us to show us his urinal. He was really <laughs> proud of that. So, was it gold? Was it a golden urinal? Uh, was it? No, it was just kind of a normal looking urinal. <laughs> just hanging there on the wall. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, if it was a party at Trump's house, I think it would have definitely been golden, right? There you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I hear he likes to show people his golden toilet. <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> well, thank you so much to our audience for tuning into this very special episode of Construction Disruption with Kyle Bobbitt of Kyle Bobbitt LLC. Hey, please watch for future episodes of our podcast. We're always blessed with great guests just like Kyle. Um, don't forget to leave a review on Apple Podcasts or YouTube. And until the next time we're together, as Kyle said, keep on disrupting, keep on challenging, keep on looking to for better ways of understanding and better ways of doing things. And don't forget to have a positive impact on everyone you encounter. Make them smile, encourage them. Simple yet uh, very positive, powerful things you can do to change the world. So God bless. Uh, take care. This is Isaiah Industries signing off until the next episode of Construction Disruption. This podcast is produced by Isaiah Industries, manufacturer of specialty metal roofing and other building products. <laughs>